advanced networking concepts. The first thing we'll talk about is a very efficient way to handle devices that are longitudinally periodic. And we'll talk more about what that is. We'll talk about how to use scattering matrices for dispersion analysis. And then last, very briefly, present some alternatives to scattering matrices. Longitudinally periodic devices. Suppose this is the device that we wish to simulate. There are something like 36 layers, and we would like to look at transmission and reflection from that device. How do we do this? Given what we know, well, we can count 36 layers, and we can set up a loop and go one layer at a time, calculate a scattering matrix, update a global scattering matrix, and combine that to get one overall scattering matrix that describes 36 unit cells. What do we think about that? Well, this would work, but it's very slow and inefficient. Imagine this were a million layers. That's going to take a long time to simulate it. Well, if we stare at this long enough, what we'll recognize is that there's only three unique layers. Let's call those A, B, and C. This suggests maybe a more efficient way to handle this. What if we just calculated the scattering matrix for A, scattering matrix for B, scattering matrix for C, and then combine all those with the red heifer star product? This is a little bit better than what we talked about on the previous slide, but it is still very slow and inefficient. Those red heifer star products are not fast. What else can we do? Again, if we stare at this, what we realize is that this stack of 36 layers is actually a, a set of repeating three layers. So if we call that A, B, and C, notice those three blocks repeat throughout this. We will call that three set of layers that repeat the unit cell. Then we can see that we actually have our device that's composed of 12 different unit cells. This suggests maybe a slightly better way that we can handle this type of device. What if we calculated a scattering matrix by cascading A, B, and C? Now we have one scattering matrix that's describing those three unit cells and then tie those together 12 different times. Well, we're doing better, probably a lot better than the previous slide, but this is still inefficient. What if there was, again, a million repeated unit cells? This is still very slow. Well, it turns out there's something very neat that we can do, and we'll talk about that next. So it's an algorithm that's called cascading and doubling, and it's probably the fastest and most efficient way I know of to handle these longitudinally periodic structures. So we might start, like we did on the previous slide, and calculate a scattering matrix that describes one unit cell. So now this times one here is telling us this describes one unit cell. So we red heifer star product, a scattering matrix for A, B, and C. Now suppose we cascaded or did a red heifer star product with that scattering matrix that described one unit cell. Well, we would get a scattering matrix that now describes two unit cells. What if we took that scattering matrix that described two unit cells and combined it with itself using that red heifer star product? Now we would have a scattering matrix describing four unit cells. We could take that scattering matrix describing four unit cells, combine it with itself. Now we have a scattering matrix describing eight unit cells. If we do it again, we have a scattering matrix describing 16 unit cells. And this can keep going on and on and on. Now, the, the efficiency that this buys you isn't necessarily apparent here, but if we had a longitudinally periodic structure that had 1 million unit cells, so that's actually 3 million layers, it would only take about 20 iterations through this. So clearly, that is very fast and efficient. 
But the big question is, what if we had 27 unit cells, something that wasn't a power of two? How do we modify this algorithm to handle any number of layers, ones that aren't just a power of two? Well, let's look at that. Here's the basic algorithm, and then I'll step you through an example to help explain this. But the first thing we're going to do is convert this number n. This is the number of layers in our stack. We're going to convert that to binary. And this really will tell us which of those scattering matrices to include in the overall global scattering matrix. So we convert it to binary. Then we initialize our algorithm. We'll initialize this global scattering matrix. This is the one we want to find. We will also initialize what we'll call the binary scattering matrix. And at first, that will just be the scattering matrix of one unit cell. This is the one that we're going to double each time. But we're only going to use this binary scattering matrix to update the global scattering matrix where the binary digits are a 1. Let's go into the main loop. So we've initialized the global scattering matrix as nothing and the binary scattering matrix as one unit cell. So we go into our loop. OK, we're not done. Of course, we just started. We look at the first digit. So our first digit in the ones place. Well, is that a 0 or a 1? If it's a 1, this means we want to update the global scattering matrix with that binary scattering matrix. So we'll use a red heifer star product to do that. Now, whether this digit was a 0 or a 1, the very next step we'll do is double this binary scattering matrix. So now it's going to be describing two unit cells, next time through the loop 4, then 8, and 16, 32, 64, and so on. But we only update the global scattering matrix when our binary digit is a 1. We've gone through all the binary digits. We're done. We have this global scattering matrix that's describing any number of unit cells we wish. doesn't have to be a power of 2. So if you're still confused, here's an example of that algorithm. So step zero, not even really a step, it's an input to the algorithm where we build this scattering matrix that describes our unit cell. I'm showing three layers here, but it could be more. Maybe you have a set of 50 layers that repeat. And so this, the unit cell scattering matrix would be those 50 layers. So that's really an input to the algorithm. The other input to the algorithm is the number of unit cells to combine. For this example, it's 22 unit cells. So that's not a power of 2. A power of 2 would be 16 or 32. So it's right in the middle there. Not a power of 2. Those are the inputs. Now the algorithm begins. So the first thing is convert that number n, 22, to binary. And here's the binary digits that we get. It's 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. Before we enter the loop, we will initialize the two scattering matrices that we need. We need our global scattering matrix essentially initialized to nothing. So that means zero reflection on the S11 and S22. And the identity matrix, so it's 100% transmission with no phase for S12 and S21. And our binary scattering matrix is our input. It's the scattering matrix for one unit cell. Now we're ready to enter the main loop. So the main loop loops through the binary digits of our number. So over here, I wrote that number to remind us we want to cascade 22 unit cells. And here is that number 22 in binary. So we set up a loop that's going to go the ones digit, the twos, the fours, the eights, and the sixteens. We go one at a time. So we look at that first digit. It's a zero. So that means we do not update the global scattering matrix. So at this point, the global scattering matrix still encompasses zero unit cells. It's still that sort of nothing scattering matrix. But no matter what, we double the binary scattering matrix. So at this point, the binary scattering matrix actually represents two unit cells, and we're ready for the next iteration. We look at the second digit. This is a one. That means we're going to update the global scattering matrix with the binary scattering matrix. Well, at this point, the binary scattering matrix represents two unit cells. So the global scattering matrix now represents two unit cells. No matter what, we will update the binary scattering matrix will now represent four unit cells. 
Next pass through the loop, we're looking at this third digit. That is also a one, which means we will update the global scattering matrix. Before that operation, the global scattering matrix encompassed two unit cells. The binary scattering matrix encompassed four unit cells. So after this calculation, our global scattering matrix will encompass six unit cells. No matter what, we double the binary scattering matrix, so that now represents eight unit cells. Next pass, we're at this fourth digit. It is a zero. It's a zero, so we do not update the global scattering matrix. So the global scattering matrix still only encompasses six unit cells. However, no matter what, we double that binary scattering matrix, which now will represent 16 unit cells. This is the last digit. It is a one, which means we're going to update the global scattering matrix again. Before this calculation, the global scattering matrix encompassed six unit cells and the binary scattering matrix encompassed 16. So when we combine those together, the global scattering matrix now encompasses 22 unit cells. No matter what, we will double our binary scattering matrix. That's 32 unit cells. That's our last digit. So the loop is over and the global scattering matrix represents 22 unit cells. Now, if we really want to make an efficient algorithm here, there's a slight problem. We doubled that binary scattering matrix, which could be a rather computationally intensive thing, particularly when we move on to rigorous coupled wave analysis, method of lines, where our scattering matrix gets very large. We would like to not do that if it's the last iteration. So think about how you would modify your algorithm so you don't do that last doubling if it's the last digit. Now let's change subjects and talk about how to use uh, scattering matrices for dispersion analysis. Let's just derive the equation. Then we can talk about what the dispersion analysis is. So we start with an overall scattering matrix for our unit cell. We've been calling this times one. And just to get away from the concept of cascading and doubling, we'll call it UC. So we have a scattering matrix for a unit cell, which could be any number of layers. So we've calculated that, and here we are. What we're going to do is rearrange this equation. And one way you can think about doing this is splitting this first two by two block matrix equation into two separate equations rearranging terms now so it's more like a transfer matrix sort of approach where the scattering matrices have inputs and outputs transfer matrices have fields on one side relating to fields on the other it's not quite a transfer matrix because we would have to bring this other matrix over to the side we could calculate a transfer matrix and in fact that's how we convert between scattering and transfer matrices but we don't want to do that so this is sort of an almost transfer matrix formulation. Now, if we're talking about a field going through a longitudinally periodic structure, the structure repeats, so does the field repeat. Well, if the field repeats, there's a periodic boundary condition. And the periodic boundary condition is this, the field at the output of that unit cell has to equal the field at the input of the unit cell with some phase incorporated. And this is another manifestation of the block theory. This parameter beta is our effective propagation constant. That's really what we would like to find. That's the dispersion analysis. So we apply that periodic boundary condition to our almost transfer matrix equation, and we end up here. If we stare at that long enough, we will recognize that as a generalized eigenvalue problem. And by generalized, there's another square matrix on the other side here. So it's an AX equals lambda BX generalized eigenvalue problem. Where these lambdas, that's not wavelength here, that is the eigenvalue. So for the generalized eigenvalue problem, we will simply build these matrices A and B from the scattering matrix elements. And... Once we have A and B in MATLAB, for example, we'll just call eig, and it will output eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Really what we're after here are the eigenvalues. 
And the way we formulated this, our eigenvalues are e to the j beta lambda z. All right, so why do we care about that? Well, if we know beta, we can actually back calculate what the permeability and permittivity is. So let's say our unit cell was some kind of metamaterial device, and this has you know, maybe a negative refractive index or something other crazy. We can step our way through this with a bunch of different layers, calculate a global scattering matrix, do this dispersion analysis to retrieve beta, and then from that, we can figure out what the effective material properties are. Now, I will admit there's a lot more to this story that I'm getting into here, and that's actually covered in another course in another lecture that I invite you to go to, but this is the basics of what's going on. Another thing we can do is construct fan diagrams, another form of the dispersion analysis. So just having scattering matrices, even if we're not interested in calculating transmission and reflection, they're still very useful for other things. We'll end this lecture just with some brief mentions of some alternatives to scattering matrices. Now of these, the transmittance matrices are the only ones that I have personally implemented. In my experience, they're about 10 times faster than scattering matrices. They're unconditionally stable. The real drawback is with scattering matrices, you can work your way through the layers and you, you can throw out all the previous scattering matrices. So it's very memory efficient. With the transmittance matrix approach, we have to save parameters as we're iterating through the layers and then go backwards again. So it's, it's two passes, which doesn't really slow it down. It's about 10 times faster. But if you have a lot of layers, you'll run out of memory. Back when I was doing this, it was in the early 2000s, and I was simulating transmission through photonic crystals, and I seem to remember running out of memory when I had about 200 different layers. And these things were so volumetrically complex, I always had to have a lot of thin little layers. So it's a great method. It is very fast, but it's not real intuitive. The intermediate parameters don't have great physical meaning. And for all those reasons, I really prefer the scattering matrices, despite them being slower. Hybrid matrices. This is something that really comes from network theory and electrical engineering as a borrowing of that. I have not implemented this, but reading the paper, I can pull out the claims benefits. Supposedly improve numerical stability. I'm not sure what's meant by that because the other methods are unconditionally stable. Supposedly it has a more concise formulation. Uh, supposedly it's simpler to implement. Supposedly it has improved numerical efficiency. And supposedly it's unconditionally stable. So those are the claim benefits. Um, I can certainly see it being faster because I know scattering matrices are slower, uh, but otherwise I can't, can't verify that. But I did provide the reference here. You're welcome to chase that and give that a try. And let me know your experience. I'm very interested. The last is something called reflection matrices or R matrices. And staring at this paper, I see scattering matrices. I really see somebody who maybe wasn't aware of what a scattering matrix was and sort of invented scattering matrices without making it scattering matrices. But perhaps there's something different here that I just haven't caught. But you will see this in the literature. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.